Welcome everyone. My name is Ed Arnold and I'm Vice President of Products here at LeveragePoint. This is another half hour webinar in our monthly series of thought leadership in the area of value-based strategy. LeveragePoint provides the only software solution for value-based pricing. We offer a SaaS-based collaboration platform that links all cross-functional team members involved in building and executing the value-based strategy. You can find out more about us by visiting our website, leveragepoint.com. That's where you'll find a recording and a download of the slides for this and all our previous webinars, plus much more. Now, during the webinar, if you have any specific questions or comments, please feel free to enter them in the right-hand panel in the questions section. And then later in the webinar, we'll respond to as many of them as we can, as well as do a follow-up on our website. Now I'd like to turn it over to Jay Manson, Leverage, Leverage Point's Vice President of Sales. Jay? Thanks, Ed. Uh, thanks, all of you, for joining us today. Um, we are very lucky today to have Stefan Luizu with us. Um, Stefan brings a truly unique and uh, multi-dimensional perspective on pricing, and I would say on business in general. You know, one of the topics that we're going to talk about today and Stefan's going to share with us today is based on the pricing transformation he drove at Ardex. Now, that perspective alone is fascinating, particularly given the size of the company uh, and the competitive environment that they operate in. It's truly remarkable what he's been able to do in a very short period of time there. But, um, you know, it's funny, in introducing Stefan, I feel a little bit like one of those um, TV pitchmen, uh, you know, pitching the Ginsu knife, there's always more. Um, you know, so Stefan also happens to be the CEO at Ardex. And as such, he gives us, an, gives us all a much richer understanding of how CEOs and other executives view pricing and what we might do to capture their attention. Um, and he's going to provide some perspective on that. The third perspective that Stefan provides us is the perspective that he's gained as he's been um, working on his PhD with Case Western Reserve. Um, very often in pricing, we hear people talk about their anecdotal experiences. And Stefan has some rich anecdotal experiences from what he's done at Ardex. But he's also been able to synthesize the experience of literally hundreds of folks who he's talked to on their pricing transformation. And I believe this, um, at the beginning of his presentation, that synthesis is really unique to his knowledge and can provide us all with some great insight. So um, there's much we can learn from Stefan and his experience, and I want to thank him in advance for his willingness to share his experience, his expertise, and his unique experience uh, and unique uh, perspective with all of us. So without further ado, Stefan, please take it away. Well, thanks very much, and uh, it's good to be here and uh, look forward to some uh, good questions from uh, uh, the 100-plus uh, people participating. Um, I will say something before I get started. Um, it is a fascinating process to talk to all these companies and uh, try to understand their pricing transformation, and uh, today you're going to see a little bit of what I found. But you will find that a transformation story in pricing is very uh, personal to the organization, I would say. There's no copy and paste. Um, each company is going to do things differently based on where they are in pricing um, as far as the maturity is concerned, but also what culture they have internally in the company and what they're facing outside in the environment. So not one uh, transformation story is going to be the same. And today we humbly uh, would show you uh, what we've done here at Ardex since 2008, um, and um, hopefully you can learn some uh, a couple things and uh, Pick some nuggets of information that you can bring back to your organization and uh, and start discussing in, you know them with uh, your staff and your your people there. So uh, before I do get into the story, uh, I just you know I'm going to brush over some uh, quick concepts so everybody's up to speed and at the same level, and also uh, uh, you know make sure that we use the same vocabulary. Uh, this uh, this is you know pretty much shows the um, the most commonly used uh, pricing orientation in the marketing literature. Uh, customer competition and cost, everybody understands the three C's. Um, and for each orientation, <clears throat> you do have a set of pricing strategies 
which are pretty much well understood and well documented in the uh, the books uh, that are available out there. So uh, it's not not much, but it, it's important to uh, to focus on the three C. Then um, um, it's 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 not a question of uh, uh, you know which pricing orientation do I use. Um, it pretty much when we price, as you know, we price with the three C's. Uh, the question is which one of the C's do we uh, adopt as a primary orientation. So here I introduce more of a degree of adoption of a, of a primary pricing orientation, which is not well discussed in pricing and marketing literature. And you will find that firms in general will adopt one orientation as a primary one and will also use cost-based and competition-based because in reality, no one can do value-based 100%. So it's a combination of uh, using the three C's, the three orientation, with a primary one. So in, in my research, in my PhD, I really, uh, you know, after talking to hundreds of companies uh, following a qualitative uh, um, phase, then uh, we developed the, uh, the 5C model of pricing transformation. And here you, uh, the critical word here is that value-based pricing cannot be adopted. It is internalized, and it is almost a transformation at the organizational level because it requires so much change. So you have to have the combination of these five C's for the transformation to be launched and, and successful over the years. Um, the first one, obviously, is you need to have a champion at the top leading the in internalization of pricing practices. And this is very important. You cannot adapt them. You internalize them. They become part of you and part of your daily work. And that requires change, you know, change um, which is supported by a general mobilization of the organization, not just pricing, but the sales force, the R&D department when we do innovation, the marketing department when we do segmentation, the finance person when we provide cost and, and support for the models. So it's a change that is a, a change capacity that is done at the organizational level. And that requires capabilities, formal and informal capabilities. The formal being more model tools, systems, uh, specific training on pricing. The informal being more around the social fabric in the firm that will change slowly but surely the DNA of the company from cost or competition to value. The big haha -ha moment in my PhD research is the concept of confidence. And uh, really, organizational confidence, which is a combination of individual confidence at the collective level, is acting as a fuel for superior pricing. You give people beliefs in their value, beliefs in their products, beliefs in their capacity to price high or low, to adapt to the customer uh, uh, feedback, and that creates a, uh, a kind of an energy of a, a general uh, uh, excitement around pricing. We found that of a very, very relevant construct for the transformation. So we'll talk more about organizational confidence, which I believe is one of the uh, subjects that is maybe the least discussed in all the pricing uh, literature. Last but not least is the center-led center pricing management model, which is a hybrid between centralized and decentralized, where you would have a, a center, centralized team of experts diffusing knowledge through the organization. Pricing decisions still remain decentralized, but the knowledge and the expertise become centralized and it's all projected to the rest of the organization. So these five C's are pretty much the model designed out of the PhD work for a mobilization towards uh, pricing excellence. So if I go to the next slide, oh, it's, uh, there we go. So, the transformation is, again, not an adoption. It's, uh, you know, you internalize what you, what you implement and, and the tools you give to your employees. And it is really, for value-based pricing, started from a problem. Typically, you will look at uh, a firm ha is having problem, uh, product failure, price erosion, cyclical demand, and they want to change something. And on the other side of the spectrum is, you know, really how do you modify the DNA of the firm, you know, moving from... Uh, cost uh, or manufacturing of absorption to, uh, to more value, customer value at the center. And you see it requires pilot programs, increased adoption, full adoption, and you're using a combination of experiential learning, experiments, pilot studies, trial, trial and error, and also a very critical concept there is transformative learning, which is based on adult learning theory. 
because you're teaching pretty much adults to adopt a new frame of reference, new language around values. So you really need to teach them differently, learn a new language in order to really make the changes irreversible. So uh, pretty much that's what came out of, uh, in a nutshell, out of my, uh, you know, research. And, uh, and it's, you know, you, some of you may have seen that at Pricing Society before or somewhere else, but uh, it is quite fascinating um, to, to wrap it up in the kind of a 5C model. Stefan, I, I really like this, this model. I particularly like the fact that it has flexibility in it. Um, and and your, um, your point, your C around confidence seems so intricately linked to the experiential learning and transfer, transformative learning mm -hmm. um, to build that confidence. Um, so it's going to look a little bit different at every company. How did this look at Ardex? How did this play out at Ardex as you were putting it together? Well, it's uh, obviously Ardex was uh, when I started the uh, the PhD work three years ago. Ardex was uh, kind of a, a lab for uh, <laughs> to experiment on the model, and really uh, every C is used. And I'll show you at the end of the uh, webinar a slide where I, I recap the five C model with the Ardex story. Um, but if you look at uh, this, uh, you know, transformation journey at Ardex, it's pretty much um, you know, around two major axes. And one is the pricing orientation on the vertical axe. How do you uh, set price? So based on cost, competition, and, and value. And the other axis is the pricing realization, which is what is your discipline in pricing? Do you have formalized processes? Do you have a strong discipline in pricing? And you capture your value out there in the market through price. And you can see, uh, you know, Rx went right before they went up. And again, it's because each company starts somewhere based on the maturity, uh, price maturity model, you may start at zero, you may start at one or two or three, depending on where you are. Um, so we decided to invest a lot in pricing processes before we actually discussed the orientation. And that's, a, that's the journey will take different shape, different curves for every company in, the, in that price, pricing capability grid. And you really want to aim to be at a very strong realization and value-based pricing. Pretty much that's where we'll, we hope to be in 2014. So you see it's a six-year journey and there is no rush. You pace yourself, you make it right, you make it relevant for customers, and you make it relevant for, uh, you know, for uh, internally for the organization. So we started, uh, you know, in pretty much in 2008 from a very cost plus approach where pricing was not discussed. Most pricing decisions uh, were done, you know, there is a strong influence from international legacy pricing based on all technologies. The pricing structure were very simple and uh, it was very um, um, based on very stable pricing, very uh, uh, structured and then very, there were not a lot of deviations in the uh, in, in pricing. Um, no pricing authority was given to sales and marketing staff and really that was critical. You know, pricing was not discussed openly and not reviewed formally. And the model was very successful. Uh, you know, obviously, when the, the crisis hit, then it challenges you a little bit on, uh, you know, on the lack of transparency, maybe communication around pricing, and uh, being able, you know, to take decisions without going all the way to the top. So that's a little bit of our stimulus was, uh, you know, we needed to implement a, a, a more flexible, a more structured, and a more value-based uh, uh, pricing uh, process. So. Um, Step one really was to, uh, as we mentioned in the in the grid, was to move right and increase the focus on pricing by allocating one person in the finance team, uh, really building a strong foundational uh, pricing knowledge, uh, including a pricing review um, in a monthly management meeting to review pricing action, variation, and discuss competition, and really started to sprinkle the organization with concepts of value prop, customer value, value driver, perceived benefits, um, to try to get people interest. Also, something you realize in your organization as you move in the uh, in the transformation that you do have people who get it, and they are what I call the informal champion in pricing. And I was something that I tried to do right away was to go out and see who is selling at a high price and how do we do it, and talking to people who get the value story, and um, and I interviewed them formally and you know we discussed things and uh, I get their opinion, and um, it was kind of a very good learning experience. Then uh, step two, 2009, 2010, that's where we really started to formalize 
the pricing process, really creating the position of pricing and revenue optimization manager, still reporting to finance. You don't want to create riots in the organization. But really, we wanted to create the typical cockpits with uh, value maps, KPIs, price waterfall, um, working with marketing function, really to look at the, how, what's the best way to uh, optimize uh, pricing levels and optimize revenue. And we introduced a special pricing program with 30 levels, um, you know, maybe closer to the field. And then we uh, really uh, invested quite a bit of uh, funds and time in uh, getting people enrolled in the CPP program. Um, eight people passed the CPP in uh, 2009 and 10, and we enrolled eight more. Um, and then at that time, in 2010, we launched the Pricing Council. That was a very, very good step to put the right people around the table with our pricing manager and really discuss the KPIs, looking at the uh, value stories, the value drivers, the dollarization process, um, and really launching the value-based pricing process for one or two products, you know, these pilots that we talked about in the model. So there we started in 2009 and 10, really to formalize the dollarization process. By dollarization, really, I mean the uh, EVE uh, of leverage point, uh, you know, the economic value estimation process, where you're looking at what are the drivers and how do you monetize or quantify these drivers. Um, so most of our new products in 2010, or almost all of them, were run through the dollarization process. Very manual in Excel, very well done, and we created these models uh, before we defined pricing uh, levels um, in teams, in the room, using Excel. Uh, and then we aligned marketing communications, uh, technical training, uh, and product development to, uh, to look at these dollarized advantages. Started doing, uh, you know, education with distributors and contractors, um, and toying around with uh, the dollar, overall the dollarization, pro dollarization process, spe specifically to, to support pricing deviation. So, uh, you know, we started really playing around in 2010, really uh, with the value-based uh, pricing concept of uh, monetizing value drivers, um, and then communicating value to customers and, and pricing based on these um, on these factors. Now. This was very manual, and, uh, and uh, it's, it works well manually when you have one, two, three, four, five products. And quickly we run into a, an overwhel overwhelming number of value drivers and information to manage uh, versions of uh, models and versions of spreadsheets. And, um, and we'll talk about this a little later. You know. So um, that moves us to uh, step three. And really, uh, as you remember in the grid, we went right and really implemented a very strong pricing process with the pricing council, elevated the pricing function in the organization, got people to use to, to talk about pricing, uh, you know, had value conversations in the pricing council and outside of the pricing council. Then uh, we really moved fast in 2011 to the implementation of value-based pricing. Moved the pricing team into marketing, added a, an analyst and really became, you know, pricing becomes a part of pretty much every process. New product introduction, business reviews, uh, manufacturing reviews, really created all the tools and templates for systematic customer value evaluation, still in Excel. Introduced pricing in the stage gate process. So you see it becomes more formalized, more across all the processes. At the same time, we expanded the pricing training program. 28 people in the CPP program. With, right now, we have 20 CPP in the organization. And our goal is to be at 10% of our employees will be CPP, which is a fairly uh, big investment. And we made it uh, non-optional for account manager, regional sales managers, and divisional sales managers. This is part of their training, required training, job description, that uh, even if we hire a new regional sales manager, they have to go through CPP. CPP really gives you the same vocabulary, the same level of knowledge, so that uh, when you go into the uh, dollarization discussion, then people speak the same language. Uh, and also, we created a pricing module for sales reps um, on uh, that uh, the pricing managers, uh, pricing manager internally conducts. Uh, we have a very intense uh, training program for our sales reps, and one of them is a pricing module. And then we implemented strategic projects, uh, you know, on pricing, starting uh, to beef up the training of distributors and contractors on the, our value stories and how to sell our products. So, you know, value-based pricing for them. And started, you know, continue to do a brainstorming session to quantify value drivers or, and, and, and services, which is fairly complicated to, uh, you know, really measure the level of your, of your service, um, you know, dollarizing your services. So uh, 
that was step three. That was last year. And uh, you could see a lot of investment and a lot of uh, process improvement and, and tools and models. So, so if you look, if you go back to the model, then the champions. I'm um, obviously I'm leading the charge. Uh, I'm a CPP myself, become a CPP, and and I study the field of ma uh, value management and pricing in my PhD. Uh, in the change level, we did a lot of changes, step by step, uh, incremental. Um, and it worked well. It was adopted. People got trained, and you know, people embraced the concepts, understood the, the value story. A lot of investment on training, uh, uh, you know, and tools. Uh, at, obviously, at the scale of Ardex, uh, which is which is a mid-sized company, we have two people in the in, in a center-led uh, pricing team with our director, uh, manager of pricing and revenue optimization, and a pricing analyst, and they really support. Uh, the divisional sales managers, the ZP and general managers, they train, they develop the tools, webinars, and they really diffuse knowledge and, and expertise and support the, uh, the pricing process. Last but not least, and I think this is the, the, an area where we, it's continuous, the investment in, in confidence and in communication, in coaching, in championing, in training, in getting people emotionally charged. Uh, you know, Let's go out there and capture the value for what's worth uh, for our products. Let's be proud of our R&D, let's be proud of our technology, and let's go out there and, and believe in our business model and, and catch a pr uh, price. So uh, so really the five C's was applied very well for the last uh, three three to four years, and, uh, and it's, it, the model still holds true today. Uh, Stefan, um, you, you've walked through this, um, this outline in five minutes. Of the um, of your journey, and, and it's really fascinating. Um, we're already getting some questions in. Um, you know, one question is one that I th said I thought you would get, and that was, um, how have customers and how's the channel responded to this um, this journey, this transformation that you're taking them through? Well, it's uh, you know, it depends on how you position it. it this is not a uh, a pricing project for them. It's it's a value. Uh, you know, let's make you know, we want to make you successful, so we're going to train you on how to sell our very technical and high-priced products. Uh, you know, we're going to train you on how the, the value messaging, the value story, so that you can go out and sell to your customers. So we get, a, you know, we actually have uh, distributors that do this very well, and we are meeting with them, and uh, so that, you know, we, we have to educate our trade partners to, to have the same message. We need to align the messages uh, down the value chain. So uh, it's been received very well. Um, obviously, sometimes uh, you know we have to do a, a lot more me uh, messages to them because our, our, sometimes our products are high priced versus competition. But we, uh, you know, we do that very well now with our dollarization process. And uh, the beauty of uh, implementing value-based pricing is you create more transparency by promoting your value drivers and explaining why the very is a premium, why there is a differential in value. So customers like it. So you satisfy their need to understand. If you just give them a high price without explaining anything, then they'll get frustrated. So, um, so far it's been only positive, uh, positive uh, feedback on these training sessions and uh, and our uh, innovation. You know, all the products we launch. So, really, what you're describing is building that confidence in the channel. Yeah. And in the yeah. customers as well. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. Um, yeah. So, one 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 other question came in was from someone who was asking, can you? Further clarify your definition of dollarization. Yeah, dollarization is uh, is you know there is a book called the Dollarization Discipline by Jeff Fox, which I give to every distributor and contractor that visits us here, and it's really the uh, monetization of uh, differential value. So if you look at the EVE uh, economy value estimation, you dollarize or you monetize. Obviously, it's, it's used do it's using do dollar because we're in the U.S., but it's monetizing the uh, the differential value. So take the driver, measure your differential value, and then transfer that into uh, the next step of the EVE. So dollarization means monetization. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I guess the next slide is what is next? Yeah, well, what is next is uh, obviously we, uh, we've done well for the last uh, three, three and a half years, and uh, we continue to do training. I think you know, capabilities of the five Cs, it's, it's very important. We never stop training. And we train the value chain so everybody has the same message, distributors, contractors, influence, uh, architects. Um, 
we do now we start a, a lot of uh, cultural training for the sales force on value and uh, you know why we should be proud of our technologies and how we sell against the uh, competition but I think at some point we run into a problem uh, which is uh, everything was manual in our value-based pricing process and uh, fragmented uh, and we're launching around depending on the years between 10 to 20 new products at the end because of the manual aspect of our uh, of our value-based pricing process we needed to create a, a we needed to adopt a platform something to uh, to really centrally and systematically manage our value-based pricing process and for that we took the decision last year to uh, implement the leverage point uh, value-based pricing platform to really have a central point uh, which is also dynamic to run our value uh, value models you know uh, list our value drivers uh, conduct the dollarization slash monetization process and also adjust all our messages depending on the target you know whether you talk to an architect or you talk to a contractor or you talk to a distributor it's a different message and we got you know because of the fragmentation and because we have 80 sales reps in the field it was very complicated to really put everything uh, together and manually so uh, that was you know a decision that we took last year and uh, we're in the uh, in the pilot process right now of the uh, leverage point implementation and we put already some we designed some uh, value models for basic products but we're also putting in a very complex solutions which uh, those are fascinating and really this is when you really un you know understand the difficulty in measuring value because you do have to you know use a what could be subjective and 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 calculate measure the perceived value for customers that's a really uh, really fascinating so uh, and then we are now tracking uh, return on investment more formally um, you know for we have a dedicated value-based pricing KPIs that we use um, and uh, this is review in the uh, viewed in the uh, pricing council uh, so we have our systematic review of KPIs and if you look at the uh, the pricing process maturity um, you know we're probably uh, moving into uh, a four with you know adopt the adoption of the, the leverage point uh, technology which is you know we're trying to optimize our uh, our drivers our value drivers and optimize our pricing decision based on you know how, how we measure value I don't think that there are size and and, and the, you know the nature of a company we can be in level five but level four and it would be uh, already uh, significant for us considering the amount of training you know value-based pricing is is not a, a destination it's a journey and attached to my LinkedIn profile, you have a, a paper that we wrote about the conceptualization of value-based pricing. You really never fully inter internalize it. It's it's a never-ending story, because your industry is a dynamics, your differentiation is dynamic, your customers are dynamic, your cost is dynamic. So at the end of the day, you constantly work on value-based pricing. You, it's not like you get there and, and then you stop working on it. So that's a big, uh, you know, that's a big. That's why you can just adopt it. You internalize it, and you continuously in, invest in it. And we found that with the platform that we implemented, the leverage form platform, we can do a solid job at going and making it a part of our DNA. Because we face a lot of complexity. You see, this is the uh, for us the complexity of value-based pricing. We deal with various stakeholders, and they all want to hear a different story. So instead of doing manual value messaging and value driver promotion then we can do that in leverage point platform and bombard the sales force uh, you know with the right value models and the right messaging adapted to the right audience so uh, this is going to uh, you know address the complexity that we face and help us uh, be very successful in the, in the future with one central uh, repository of uh, all these value drivers and all these value messages uh, you know this is why we're very interested so um, you know if, if you ask me um, you know what were the key, key success factor for our transformation over the past uh, three years and what's going to make us successful in the next two years the first one obviously is to uh, you need you need to build the capabilities to monetize differential value and to manage complexity you know that and this is really the central point you know how do you measure value how do you are you able to measure your differential value if you're saving uh, labor or if you're saving machine time or if you're saving you know the, the the floor is flat versus not flat can you measure it do you have the right capabilities internally to do this Do you have the right engineering power to do this do you have the right customer 
relationship to go and ask him. So that was, uh, you know, that's something that we uh, we've been doing very well, and we're in the middle of that now with with the leverage point deployment, which forces you to do every single, you know, calculation. The second one is the uh, the alignment. You know, pretty much we created because it's a transformation, and we consider it a transformation. We have uh, everybody aligned: sales, marketing, R and D, tech support, and the messaging goes everywhere. Um, you know, including customer service. You know. Promote uh, every customer touch point will have a value story, you know, the same value messaging. Uh, but everybody understands why we're doing this. So, in the deployment of uh, Leverage Point technology, we have a multifunctional team of experts working on it. Investments in uh, uh, infrastructure were key. You know, we uh, implemented SAP, and uh, now we have the Leverage Point uh, platform. We have special apps. We'll put uh, our dollarization on the applications on the uh, Artix app for uh, the iPhone. We do a lot of webinars, so the use of technology and, and infrastructure is important to support your uh, your transformation. Communication, uh, you know, it's it's a, an ongoing battle, uh, but uh, we have a very good relationship with our sales force. We do national and regional sales meetings, and we constantly train them on pricing, constantly reinforce the value the story, and we don't do enough training on coaching on on, on value and, and building their self esteem, and it's all a story of a self esteem, not only personal self-esteem of, of people selling uh, technical products, but also collective self-esteem. Can your organization feel the power and have the belief in their business model so they go out and really feel confident when they price? Not arrogant, confident. And across the board training was, uh, you know, we've invested a lot of money on, uh, on training and uh, we do a CPP plus uh, internal training and uh, external training. So. Uh, this is I, I cannot stress that enough. You know, build your capabilities in house. Don't rely 100% on consultants. Consultants are good for for you to do special projects and special uh, problem solving, but build uh, your capabilities for the long term. You need to develop sustainable pricing capabilities. Uh, so uh, we've done that very well. So th these are the kind of the wrap up of five uh, five key success factors for us. Uh, Stefan. Uh Thank you so much. Um, there's a lot of good stuff here, and uh, the questions are kind of piling in. So let me try and let me try and uh, carve these out a little bit. Um, okay. One set of questions was very much about how are you measuring your success? What's the ROI that you received? What are different KPIs that you might have used other than ROI to determine whether you're moving in the right direction? Okay. Well, that's uh, you know obviously, I, I, as you can imagine, we're a privately owned company, so I cannot discuss profit or. Um, although I can tell you we're doing fine. Um, you know, I think the number one uh, thing that we we look is uh, look at is as a success factor is the transparency of our pricing strategy. Customer complaints, uh, you know, not understanding our pricing models, you know, um, so complaints with distributors and distributors complaining to us. But by uh, uh, by really s selling the value story and making very clear why customer pays a certain price, you know, it's, it's, it creates satisfaction with pricing. I would say so. Pricing satisfaction is, is definitely something that we eventually will measure. Um, builds credibility. Um, and, and, you know, if you look at the tangible measurement, we, we're you know because it's a pragmatic. Internalization of value-based pricing. You do pilot studies, and for these projects and, and products and, and pilot studies, you can measure incremental pricing. Because the way we used to do pricing and the way we do it now is completely different. Now, sometimes the price may be a little lower, but most of the time our innovation are priced higher. So that incremental you can measure, and this is incremental ROI, I would say. So you do have to define your own cockpit for value-based pricing measurement, and I recommend I wrote a wrote um, a a piece uh, recently on the Leverage Point uh, blog and also uh, in the PPS uh, journal that just came out on that. It's important to sell that internally to your management so that specifically for value-based pricing expenses, you do have a specific tracking, tracking mechanism. Incremental profit, incremental innovation uh, power, you know, pricing satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera. Great. Great. So there's another class of questions that we're that I'm seeing here, and it's about um, you described a little bit about how cu how customers in the channel was responding. Mm -hmm. 
How's the competition responding to your transformation? Well, we uh, we are the price leader in the market, and uh, we uh, not uh, the highest price, but we are um, you know pretty much uh, first one to uh, to market for price increases and price management, and uh, and uh, we do an excellent job with value uh, value management. The competition we we are facing some cost cutters, and we're fi facing some followers, but you know it's very dynamic. And um, right now we're still going through a, a recession here in the U.S. or in construction. And uh, the bottom line is, you know, they'll they'll make decisions on their own, on you know, sometimes to attack us or sometimes to. Uh, I don't think this is related to the fact that we are no now more value oriented. It's related to the fact that they just to conduct their business this way. And uh, we, for Artex, we focus on bringing to market uh, innovative products that are that are priced. You know, at the right level, based on value drivers and, and value prop. So, um, and because the value maps, you know, we do value maps, and they're very dynamic. And uh, sometimes we're forced to, you know, respond and uh, take, make decisions or to adapt our specific uh, special pricing program. Uh, but most of the time, you know, we because we we dollarize now, and monetize every single uh, product, then we know exactly where we want to be and what are the thresholds. So. Um, Having having that platform in place, the leverage point platform, and having a, a very strong dollarization process helps you react in a more intelligent manner uh, because you know exactly what competition is doing and and are you willing to follow or not? How much do you want to give back, etc. So uh, I would say um, it's um, it's it it creates more um, scientific process for you internally to respond. Yes. Yes. Well, Stefan, this is, um, we've run over a little bit of our half hour, which we, um, I think that looking at the list of questions, we could probably use a full hour next time if, we, if we're lucky enough to get you to come next time. Yep. Um, Thank you. For those of you who want to hear more, um, Stefan is uh, a regular speaker in a number of different uh, environments. Um, he's going to be at the Harvard Club on the 18th. You're going to be um, a keynote speaker at PPS May 10th. Um, so there's a lot of places where you can hear Stefan speak, and, um, and there's an awful lot that he has written on this topic that is all uh, very rich in content and worth considering. Um, next month, we will be having a, uh, another webinar, April 18th. Uh, Jim Geisman will be speaking. He is the founder of Software Pricing Partners, um, and Jim is going to be leading us in a discussion on how to improve uh, negotiations with software deals. Um, while he is focused in the software marketplace, um, his knowledge can truly be applied across all industries, and I think you all will find it very interesting. But, um, it, the, but I also wanted to give you uh, Stefan's email, so if you have any specific questions, you should feel free to reach out to Stefan. Uh, he's very busy. Um, you can imagine with all the hats that he's wearing, um, but he may be able to respond to you. And for those of you who ask questions that we weren't able to answer in this webinar, we will be sure to be posting those answers on our website um, in the next week or so. So again, I would like to Thanks, Stefan, again, so much for his time and his willingness to provide this insight with us. Um, and I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us uh, in this webinar. And we hope that you will continue to come to these webinars to hear what thought leaders like Stefan are doing in the industry. So thanks we look forward to Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you for being here.